Hi, my name is Anna, and every week I summarize a book for you. And if you are enjoying these videos, please subscribe to my channel, like and comment on these videos. Engagement is what helps promote my work here on YouTube, and I really do appreciate it. And please let me know if there are specific topics or books you'd like me to cover. Today, I will be discussing Emotional Agility by Susan David. This book is based on many studies in the field of neuroscience and psychology, and provides a new approach to navigating life's many ups and downs. Nothing in life ever works out the way we want it. But what if that wasn't a big deal? The goal of the book is to help us become more aware of our emotions, to learn to accept them, and then to thrive by increasing our emotional agility. The tools and techniques won't make us a perfect person who never says the wrong thing or is never affected by shame, guilt or anger. It's about making peace with our most difficult emotions. First, we will discuss what emotional agility is. Then we will deep dive into four specific steps we should take to achieve it. And then we will also discuss how we can apply this to parenting our kids. So we raise them to be emotionally agile people. To explain what emotional agility is, we need to first look at what emotions are. Emotions, from blind rage to love, are our body's immediate physical response to signals from the outside world. So our hearts may start beating faster, our muscles may tighten or relax, based on our senses picking up on outside information. And this natural guidance system is much more useful when we don't try to fight it. But that's not always easy to do, because our emotions are not always reliable. In some situations, they work as some kind of radar to give us the most accurate and insightful read into what's going on in a situation, which is what we call gut feelings. But in other situations, emotions bring up old business, confusing our perception of what's happening in the moment with painful past experiences. These powerful sensations can take over completely, clouding our judgment and steering us in the wrong direction. And it's so true with parenting, because whatever happens with our kids in the moment often brings up a lot of old emotions based on our own childhood. Many people operate much of the time on emotional autopilot, and a growing body of research has shown that emotional rigidity, which is about getting hooked on thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that don't serve us, is associated with a range of psychological problems, including depression and anxiety. Emotional agility is about being flexible with your thoughts and feelings. It is key to well-being and success. It's about choosing how you'll respond to your emotional warning system. We produce thousands of thoughts every single day. This is what the author calls monkey chatter. We often accept these statements in our head as facts, especially as they often come with full visualization and feelings. But most are a complete mixture of evaluation and judgment. They are completely subjective. Thoughts are just thoughts, not facts. There are different ways people deal with their uncomfortable emotions or situations. Are you a brooder or are you a bottler? Bottlers try to get over it by suppressing their emotions, by pushing them to the side and getting on with things. Studies have shown that this is more of a male characteristic, which is actually not surprising given that past generations have raised their boys with the premise that boys don't cry. The problem with bottling is that ignoring troubling emotions doesn't get to the root of the problem. The deeper issue remains. Bottling is like storing a corrosive substance in a plastic bottle. You might be able to contain it, but soon it will start to leak out, because suppressed emotions inevitably surface in the most unintended ways. They've just gone underground, ready to pop back up at any time, and usually with surprising and inappropriate intensity created by the containment pressure they've been under. Brooders are more likely to be women. Hi, my name is Anna, and I'm a brooder. They can't let go, obsessively thinking about the hurt, perceived failure, or anxiety. Brooders lose perspective. You know, when you have an argument with your husband and you keep brooding over it, and then you end up divorcing him in your head? Brooders are at least feeling the feelings, but emotions become more powerful in the same way a hurricane does, circling and circling and picking up more energy with each pass. Brooders pay too much attention to their internal chatter and simmer over it. It takes up massive amounts of intellectual energy. It's exhausting and unproductive. And brooders are hard to deal with because they often want to talk it out, but even the people who love us the most can reach empathy fatigue. There is one more common strategy to deal with uncomfortable emotions that is just as unhealthy. And this is about the belief that all will be well if we just keep on smiling. This strategy is so rife in today's world where there is this toxic positivity, as if you can put positive affirmations on top of your feelings and not deal with them. It's just not that simple. These three strategies, bottling, brooding, and chasing happiness, come from our discomfort with negative emotions. 
They are short-term emotional aspirin. And the problem with that is if we don't deal with the source of the pain, we miss the ability to deal with it once and for all. Sometimes they can be useful. Say if you have an argument with your husband or your child the morning of a big presentation at work, you will need to bottle it for now. It's when these coping strategies are used as default coping methods that they become counterproductive. We need to learn to become comfortable with bad moods and bad feelings. Bad moods can actually help us form necessary arguments, improve our memory, encourage perseverance, make us more attentive and less prone to confirmation bias. Bad feelings can actually be messengers we need to teach us things about ourselves and can prompt insights into important life directions. For example, envy can be a strong motivator for self-improvement, and sadness can teach us to pay more attention to our own needs and seek help from other people. So how can we become more emotionally agile? The author came up with a four-step process to help us reach emotional agility. The first step is called showing up, and it's about acceptance. Facing your thoughts, emotions, and behaviors willingly with curiosity and kindness. We are often good at giving and helping other people, but we are very bad at showing the same empathy to ourselves. But acceptance is a prerequisite for change. We still don't like the things we don't like, but we just cease to be at war with them. So when it comes to parenting, you may not be a positive parent all of the time, but the first step is to stop berating and shaming yourself when you scream at your kids. You need to accept those uncomfortable feelings. We need to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And we need to stop seeing feelings as good or bad, but as just being. By confronting our pain and acknowledging it, we can move through the experience, learn from it, and come out the other side rather than being stuck. And to be able to do this, we need a rich and nuanced emotional vocabulary. And I won't be going into too much detail about it now because I already covered this when I did the summary of nonviolent communication. So I will leave a link up here. There is a world of difference between I feel stressed and I feel disappointed. And when we can name our feelings accurately, they provide a lot of useful information. They point us in the direction of our hurt. Once we stop trying to eliminate distressing feelings or smothering them with positive affirmations or rationalizations, they can teach us valuable lessons. The second step is called stepping out, which is about detaching from and observing emotions and thoughts to see them for what they are just thoughts, just emotions. Stepping out creates a gap between stimulus and response. When we are entangled in our thoughts and emotions, we typically only have one perspective, one answer. It's only when we step out that we can see that there might be more than one way of looking at a situation. The view from above that broadens your perspective and makes you more sensitive to context is particularly useful when we make mistakes. Because even when we make mistakes, there are always lessons to be learned and potential for growth. There are two methods that we can use to practice stepping out. The first one is journaling. Studies have shown the power of journaling. People who wrote about emotionally charged episodes experienced marked increase in their physical and mental well-being. And if you don't like writing, voice recording is just as effective. In the process of writing or voice recording, you are creating the space between the thinker and the thought, the feeler and the feeling. And that allows you to gain perspective, disengage and move forward. And the second thing that we can be doing is practicing mindfulness. It's this quality of being fully present and aware. Mindfulness helps us to become more emotionally agile because it helps us observe the thinker having the thought. And mindfulness is not just meditation. Personally, I find it very difficult to meditate. The author gives us four very simple ways of doing it. The first one is to focus on your breathing for one full minute. The second one is to ob observe an object like your water bottle for a full minute in every detail. The third one is to really listen to music and to pay attention to the melody. And the fourth one is to pick something that you do mindlessly every day, like brushing your teeth, and focus on each step and action. The breathing space that you create gives you the great gift of choice. You begin to experience your thoughts as just thoughts rather than directives that need to be followed or even agonized over. You can have a thought, notice it, and then purposefully choose to set it aside. This is not bottling because you are not ignoring or suppressing the thought or emotion. You are curiously noticing it and the information it brings, but not allowing it to call the shots. The third step is walking your why. This is about focusing on our core values, our most important goals. 
Walking your why is the art of living by your own personal set of values. It's the beliefs and behaviors that matter to you and bring a sense of satisfaction and meaning to your life. This is a crucial step of achieving emotional agility. And the problem is we often make decisions that are not our own. These are decisions that have been imposed on us by other people, whether it's our parents or society. I remember my mom telling me this story of a friend of hers who studied to become a doctor. And in France, studying to become a doctor takes seven years and it's highly competitive and intense studying. And he became a doctor, was highly dissatisfied with his life, decided to quit his job, move to a village in the mountain and became a teacher. And I've heard of so many examples like this one. Identifying our personal values and family values is just so important. It allows us to make decisions that match up to the way we hope to live and to use our sets of values as signposts to guide us through each decision point. And values aren't universal. What's right for one person might not be for someone else. But there are a few questions you can ask yourself to help you identify your own values. What do I want my life to look like? What relationships do I want to build? How do I feel most of the time? And what kind of situations make me feel most alive and happy? When you know what you care about, you can then be free of what you don't care about. And it's especially important for parenting because being a good parent may mean so many different things for different people based on their own set of values. And the beauty of walking your why is that even if you end up making the wrong decision, you can at least take confidence in knowing that you made the decision for the right reasons. The fourth step is called moving on. And it's about making small deliberate tweaks infused with your values because they can make a huge difference in your life instead of having lofty goals of total transformation. If you are training for a marathon, you wouldn't start running 42 kilometers straight away. You would make small little steps towards that goal. So it's the same in everyday life. If you are not happy with your job, the best option might not be to actually quit your job, but make changes where you are with what you have. Each tweak may not look like much on its own, but bit by bit, you will actually end up with a completely different story at the end. And this is so true when it comes to practicing positive parenting. I mentioned in the previous video when I summarized no drama discipline that to achieve positive parenting, it's about making small steps every day, consistency and practice. And every day you might not think that you are moving the needle at all, but you actually are. You are making a lot of progress. And if you practice this every day for a year, you will have a completely different family dynamic. So how can we raise emotionally agile children? It's about applying these four steps to ourselves so we can model it, but also allowing our kids to have all the emotions because we become butlers or brooders early in life. So it's very important that we are intentional about how we are approaching managing emotions with our kids. In our attempt to raise children that are more capable and confident, there is this trend of shielding them from adverse experiences. And unfortunately, this means that our children don't gain the experience of failure and moving on from setbacks, building their resilience in the process. Because building resilience takes practice. And the truth is we won't be able to shield our children from all challenges and setbacks. So the best thing that we can be doing is teaching them the skills of emotional agility so that they can apply them whenever a problem arises. Because no matter what that problem is, the skills don't change. So here are a few things that we can be doing. The first is to lead by example and showing our kids how we process our own emotions. The second one is to allow our children to express all of their emotions, the good and the bad ones. All emotions are okay. It's the behavior that's not always okay. And in doing so, we teach our children that emotions aren't scary. They pass and they can actually teach us a lot of things. We need to give them the gift of emotional autonomy by involving them in decision making and problem solving. And if there's a situation where we can't involve them in the decision making, we can at least explain the rationale behind the decision. And we should also minimize external rewards like stickers and lollies so they can find their own motivations for doing things. The ultimate goal of emotional agility is to keep a sense of challenge and growth well and alive throughout your life. We all tend to think that we need to have everything figured out and to be happy all the time. But if we can shift this mindset to realize that life is actually about learning and growing, that life is a journey and there is no final destination, we can actually realize that parenting is the best personal development practice on the planet. That's it for today. Here is a summary of the book so you can take a screenshot on your phone. 
And if you have enjoyed this video, please leave me a like and please leave me a comment and introduce yourself. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching and keep growing.